ಅಕ್ಷೂರೋನ್ಮೀಳಿತ ಜೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀಚೈತನ್ಯ ಮನೋಭೀಷ್ಟ ಸ್ಥಾಪಿತ ಯೇನ ಭೂತಲೆ ಸ್ವಯಂ ರೂಪ ಕದಾ ಮಹ್ಯಂ ದಾತಿ ಸ್ವಪದಾಂತಿಕ ವಂದೇಹಂ ಶ್ರೀಗುರೋ ಶ್ರೀಯುತ ಪರಕಮಲ ಶ್ರೀಗುರು ವೈಷ್ಣವಾಂಶ್ಚ ಶ್ರೀರೂಪ ಸಾಗ್ರಜಾತ ಸಹ ಗಣರಘುನಾಥ ಪಿತ ತಂ ಸಜೀವ ಸಾಧ್ವೈತ ಸಾವಧೂತ ಪರಿಜನ ಸಹಿತ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ದೇವ ಶ್ರೀರಾಧಾಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪಾದ ಸಹ ಗಣಲಿತ್ರೀ ವಿಶಾಖಾನ್ ಪಿತ ಹೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರುಣಾ ಸಿಂಧೋ ದೀನಬಂಧೋ ಜಗತ್ಪೇ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗೋಪಿಕಾಂತ ರಾಧಾಕಾಂತ ನಮೋಸ್ತುತೆ ತಪ್ತ ಕಾಂಚನ ಗೌರಾಂಗಿ ರಾಧೇ ಬೃಂದಾವನೇಶ್ವರಿ ವೃಷಭಾನುಸುತೆ ದೇವಿ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಹರಿ ಪ್ರಿಯ ವಾಂಚಾಕಲ್ಪತರುಭ್ಯ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧುಭ್ಯ ಪತಿ ಪಾವನೆಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧರ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸಿ ಗೌರಭಕ್ತವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಗವದ್ ಗೀತಾ ಆಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಕಾಮೆಂಟರಿ ಬೈ ಹಿಸ್ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಗ್ರೇಸ್ ಎ ಸಿ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವಿರಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಶ್ರೀ ಗೋಪಾದ್ ಫೌಂಡರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಚಾರ್ಜ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಇಂಟರ್ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಫಾರ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕಾನ್ಷಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಸೇವಿಯರ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಮೈ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಮಾಸ್ಟರ್ ಟುಡೇ ವಿಲ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಏಯ್ಟೀನ್ ದ ಪರ್ಫೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ರೆನೌನ್ಸಿಯೇಷನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಆನ್ ಟೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ನಂಬರ್ ಸೆವೆಂಟಿ ಫೋರ್ essentially the last verse of the Bhagavad Gita <clears throat> or at least the beginning so please repeat after me sanjaya uvacha sanjaya uvacha iti aham vasudevasya parthasya ca mahatmanah samvadam imam ashrosham ಅದ್ಭುತ ರೋಮಹರ್ಷನ ಇಂವಾಸುದೇವಸ್ಥಾತ್ಮನ ಸಂವಾದ ಇಮಶ್ಲೋಷ ಅದ್ಭುತ ರೋಮಹರ್ಷನ ಇಂ ವಾಸುದೇವ ಪಾರ್ಥಸ್ಯ ಮಹಾತ್ಮನ ಸಂವಾದ ಇಮಶ್ಲೋಷ ಅದ್ಭುತ ರೋಮಹರ್ಷನ ಸಂಜಯ ಉಚ ಇಂ ವಾಸುದೇವ ಮಹಾತ್ಮನ ಸಂವಾದ ಇಮಶ್ಲೋಷ ಅದ್ಭುತ ರೋಮಹರ್ಷನ ಇಂ ವಾಸುದೇವ ಮಹಾತ್ಮನ ಸಂವಾದ ಇಮಶ್ಲೋಷ ರೋಮಹರ್ಷನ ಇಂ ವಾಸುದೇವ ಮಹಾತ್ಮನ ಅದ್ಭುತ ರೋಮಹರ್ಷನ ಇಂ ವಾಸುದೇವ ಮಹಾತ್ಮನ ಸಂವಾದ ಇಮಶ್ಲೋಷ ಅದ್ಭುತ ರೋಮಹರ್ಷನ 
Let's all turn off our cell phones. Thank you. <coughs> Sanjaya Uvacha. Sanjaya said. Iti. Thus. Aham. I. Vasudevasya of Krishna Parthasya and Arjuna Cha also Maha Atmanaha of the Great Soul Samvadam Discussion Imam This Ashlosham Have Heard Adbhutam Wonderful Roma Harishanam, making the hair stand on end. Translation Sanjaya said, Thus I have heard the conversation of two great souls, Krishna and Arjuna. And so wonderful is that message that my hair is standing on end. Please repeat Sanjaya said, Thus have I heard. The conversation, the conversation of two great souls, two great souls Krishna, Krishna and, Arjuna. and Arjuna. And so wonderful is that message, so is that, message that my hair is standing on end. <coughs> Purport by His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada. In the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, Dhritarashtra inquired from his secretary, Sanjay, what happened on the battlefield of Kurukshetra? The entire study was related to the heart of Sanjaya by the grace of his spiritual master, Vyas. He thus explains the theme of the battlefield. The conversation was wonderful because such an important conversation between two great souls had never taken place before and would not take place again. It was wonderful because the Supreme Personality of Godhead was speaking about himself and his energies to the living entity Arjuna, a great devotee of the Lord. If we follow in the footsteps of Arjuna to understand Krishna, then our life will be happy and successful. Sanjay realized this, and as he began to understand it, he related the conversation to Dhritarashtra. Now it is concluded that wherever there is Krishna and Arjuna, there is victory. <coughs> Shri Guru Paramananda Premananda Phala Pradavrajananda Pradananda Sevayam Maam Nyojiya Vande Shri Guru Devam Tam Karuna Vinunalayam Yat Kripa Lavale Shena Pamaropya Marayate First of all, let me offer my respectful obeisances and to such an august assembly. I'm very sorry that I have to speak in front of so many senior and respectable God brothers. Please give me your blessings that I can say something appropriate and satisfying to your hearts. <clears throat> <clears throat> there are not many comments on this verse. Srila Prabhupada has not said so much in one paragraph. And no one before him, as far as I can tell, has said even as much as Srila Prabhupada has said. It's an interesting fact about the commentaries on Vedic literature in general, that the later you get in time, the longer the commentaries get. What does that suggest? We're all dumbing down. Manda sumanda mataya manda bhagya hupadruta dyadi. So, anyway, Srila Prabhupada is, thank God, Srila Prabhupada has said as much as he said. Um, so, Vishila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur had written comments 
Madhvacharya does not comment on these verses, as far as I know. Sridhar Swami has not said very much about them either. Uh, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says he had written some minor comments on these last five verses of the Bhagavad Gita, but he lost them. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada also lost his commentary, but Srila Prabhupada wrote it over again. In fact, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says that his comments on the last five verses of this Bhagavad Gita, they were carried away by the carrier of Ganesh. <laughs> Who is the carrier of Ganesh? <laughs> a rat, yeah, a mouse. So who knows what kind of Leela that was. But that's what he says. So, and he said he didn't bother to rewrite them because they were inconsequential, in his opinion. Uh, Baladevi Dabhushan also, on this verse, he more or less he just glosses the word Adhuta. So I'm going to dilate on that word. It's something that Prabhupada has also paraphrased in his own commentary. Baladevi Dabhushan glosses the word Adhutam as Vismayakaram, something that causes you to be astonished. What does Adhuta mean? It means wonderful, it means amazing, it means uh, something that's perplexing even, something that you, ju you just, it's, it's uh, something very, very extraordinary. <coughs> that's about all he says, other than pointing out that this is essentially the, the end of the Bhagavad Gita, because after all, what more is there to say than what Arjuna said? There are many, many different ways of interpreting Bhagavad Gita, I like to point out. There are many commentaries on this great conversation. There are many different views on life and what the Bhagavad Gita teaches. <clears throat> and it's been noted by several scholars that Hinduism generally teaches you that you can believe pretty much anything you want to believe, but when it comes to what you're going to do, that you have no choice. <laughs> so, here in Bhagavad Gita also, although there are many ways to interpret this book, in the end, the conclusion is very clear. We heard this just, I guess, yesterday. Nashto moha smritir labdha arjuna vacha tvat prasadat mayachita sthito smi gata sandeha karishye vachanam tava karishye vachanam tava iti this is the idea. I'm going to do what you say, period. The, the whole Bhagavad Gita is meant only to get Arjuna to fight. And, of course, he's not just mindlessly following instructions. Krishna has also explained so much knowledge. He's explained how you gain knowledge. How do you gain knowledge in this world? Who knows? How do, how do we gain knowledge? How do we gain, I should say, not how do we gain knowledge, but how do we gain the adhikar to receive knowledge? That's a little harder. Knowledge we know. We get it from, you know, Krishna says himself, tad vidhi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadakshanti tad jnanam jnaninas tattva we, we have to go to the person who's actually realized something. The person who has knowledge can share his knowledge with us. And we have to inquire submissively from that person and we have to be ready to render service. Samit pani shrotriyam brahmanishtam. The Shr uh, Shruti mantra says that a person has to go carrying firewood in hand. That means ready to, you've gone out and collected firewood. You've gone out in the, into the forest, perhaps, where there's all kinds of snakes and scorpions and worse, robbers. I think about it. But you've done this for your spiritual master. This is what earned Krishna and Balaram the blessings of Sandipani Muni, isn't it? They, they were selflessly devoted to the task of following their spiritual master's order. Sometimes it's not easy to follow the orders of the spiritual master. Ajamil was doing much the same thing, wasn't he? And he messed up. So that's, there are accidents even on royal roads. 
Anyway, the idea is that we gain knowledge by hearing because this is a descending process. Especially this knowledge can really only be given to us. And so we approach a spiritual master. That's how we gain knowledge. But the question is, how do we get the adhikar to receive that knowledge? Who can say something about this? It's based on the Bhagavad Gita. Think about the contents of the Gita. A faithful person will gain knowledge, it's true. But Jeev Goswami describes in his commentary on the Chatu Shloki Bhagavatam, <coughs> who has, I mean the qualification is that we have to be sushrushu. What does sushrushu mean? In, in, in modern language, sushrushu means somebody who's always like this. <laughs> right? Chamach. <laughs> Chamchi. <laughs> Chamcha. So, you know, it's not just somebody who is very obsequious, as we fancy English word for the same thing, but somebody who's fawning, you know, sycophant is another word for it. But sushrushu means actually somebody who wants to hear. And what does the Bhagavatam say about who, somebody who wants to hear and how he gets the adhikar to hear? Shushrusho shradhanasya vasudeva katharuchi syan mahatsevaya vipra that we've already discussed. We serve the devotees. So Jeev Goswami says, when he's talking about the Chatushaloki Bhagavatam, which is everything, unless one is actually Shushrushu, because that's, that's our beginning point in Krishna consciousness. We're faithful, we're humble, we're ready to serve, and we hear. Yathagnyasasi tatrino. I'm told that this is the, 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 the most often lectured upon verse uh, from the Bhagavad Gita. Srila Prabhupada would speak from chapter 7, text number 1. So Sushrushu. Now, I'm not Sushrushu. What do I do? Jiv Goswami addresses this. If we don't have that qualification that we're faithful, or if we're lacking faith, because most of us have some faith, everybody has some faith, no matter where they're investing that faith, everybody has some faith. But if we want more faith, and if we are not ready to, to follow some of the spiritual master's orders, I was thinking about this this morning, almost all of us are following some instructions of the spiritual master, and almost all of us are not following some instructions of the spiritual master, isn't it? So it's different for different people. Somebody's good in this department, somebody's better in the other department, but who is it who's really heard everything? Therefore, Chief Goswami, he raises this question that if, if we do not have this qualification of being sushrushu, ready to serve humbly and ready to, eager to hear, actually sushrushu is a desiderative verb, it means you, you want to hear, you really want to hear. That's, that's why Narottam Das Thakur says, Guru Mukha Padma Vakko Chite Te Koriya Aikya. A person who makes his own desire the same thing as whatever he's hearing from his spiritual master, that's not an easy thing. And yet that's our beginning point. That's entry-level Krishna consciousness. Adao shraddha tada ityadi. So he says that a person in this condition should very carefully carry out his uh, swadharmas, especially varnashram dharmas, and become purified gradually. That's why we find in the Vishnu Purana when Sagar and Maharaj asks his spiritual master, Arva Muni, <coughs> how I'm responsible for all these people. He was conscious of his responsibility. Nowadays, leaders are not very mindful of their responsibility, especially in the modern... Modern world means Western world, but it's been imported everywhere. So, <coughs> The modern mindset is that we're focused more on our rights. Human rights, we, we talk about, right? Civil rights, right? Gay rights. Next thing it will be dogs' rights and every other kind of rights. Instead, in a political treatise written by Mahatma Gandhi, he wrote called Sindh, uh, I'm sorry, Hind Swaraj. He discusses that the 
one of the hallmarks of traditional Indian civilization, and traditional Indian civilization means Vedic civilization, one of its hallmarks is that there's much, much more concern with one's duties than one's rights. Both things are there. You have to have some, uh, you have to have some facility to, to carry out your duty. That's why even in the mundane shastras we find dharma, artha, and kama are important. Prabhupada said these things are like salt. If you eat without any salt, it's very difficult, isn't it? You'll not have much enthusiasm. You probably won't eat very well. So a conditioned soul requires these things. And therefore, these Vyasadeva spent most of his attention, in fact, until the very end, when he was not satisfied. He asked his own spiritual master, well, what, what do I do about this? And he said, well, you've got to really bring it all together connect all the dots, as we say, and, you know, tell people what the ultimate goal here is. What is the supreme? Tarsavaipung sam paro dharma. So, <clears throat> without getting ahead of ourselves, Sagar Muni asks, or Sagar Maharaj asks Ardhava Muni, I, I'm responsible for all these citizens. I want to know, how do I bring ordinary people not great sages, not sinful rascals, but ordinary people, presumably like most of us. How do I bring them to Krishna consciousness? This was his question. Is this a question, or a concern rather, that's shared by the majority of the members of this society, International Society for Krishna Consciousness? Are we concerned about bringing people into Krishna consciousness? Yes, we are. So, he gave a long answer that encompasses a few chapters, famous passage of the Vishnu Purana. But the gist of his answer is very often quoted by Srila Prabhupada when he says, Varnashrama Charavata Purushena Pada Puman. That the, 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 the way that to perform Varnashram Dharma, that is the Nanya Tatojakanana Vishnu Radhite Pungsan. That is the way that Vishnu is worshipped, and in fact, there's really no other access, even to bhakti. This is the confirmation of what Krishna has told Arjuna already long ago in chapter 7, text 28. He's indirectly, he's hinting to all of us, who are the people who can actually maintain their Krishna consciousness forever? Who are they? I can speak from personal experience on this. I was initiated in 1977, early 1977. I joined maybe a year or so before that. But very, very few of the people who were surrounding me then are still here now. And this confirms the statistics that Krishna gives in Bhagavad Gita. What are they? No, no, no. The statistics. I'm looking for stats. Okay, that's a good one. But there's more, more explicit than that. Manushyanam sahasreshu ityadi. One out of a thousand people is even interested, really interested. And out of those really serious practitioners, Krishna says, hardly one understands me. So it's one in a million. These are the statistics. So Krishna is therefore giving us a hint in chapter 7 what you can do about this. If you want to increase your odds, <laughs> if you will. Uh, then you have to become punyatma, punyatma, or dharmatma. And the best way to do that is, of course, bhakti yoga, believe it or not. Shuddhyanti tasmai prabhavishnave namaha. We, we don't take varnashram dharma separately from bhakti. But when it is the order of the spiritual master, then it is absolutely intrinsic and essential for that bhakti. We cannot hide behind the bhakti in order to evade this order. That's something to think about. Anyway, so Jeev Goswami says, especially by doing this, by being pious, by, by and Krishna describes in chapter 7, text 28, what happens? Punya karma nam. When, when you are engaged in punya karma, you, you're not doing any karma that is not enjoined in the Shastra or anything that is antithetical to what is enjoined in the Shastra or anything that neglects the Shastra. You're not willing to do those things anymore. 
Then you become purified. And what is the symptom of the purifi- purification? Te dvanva moha nirmuksa. They become freed from the dvanva moha. Dvanva moha is the natural byproduct of a s- sinful life. And sinful life is, I mean, we don't really understand what is the difference between a sinful life and a pious life in the modern world. Because the default station, you automatically will be socialized as a sinful person, a papatma, if you just grow up and lead a so-called normal life in the modern world. It's, it's automatically going to color your consciousness in various ways that are not appro- appropriate and not conducive to Krishna consciousness. It's like when you go to college. You can take a certain course, but only if you've taken the prerequisite course. You, you cannot enter this course unless you've had the prerequisite course. So we're all kind of in that situ- situation. We, you know, I remember when I went to college, <clears throat> I didn't take any foreign languages in high school. So they made me take a few foreign languages in college, but I didn't get credit for all of them. For, for one of them, they said, you're just removing deficiencies. Removing deficiencies. You didn't have this in high school, so you've got to, count, you've got to make up for that now. This is what we do. When, when a papi comes to Krishna consciousness, we experience quite often that they spend years sometimes, decades even, just, just coming up to the platform of being a bona fide human being. <laughs> It, it, so it would seem. I remember Tamal Krishna Goswami once, he was explaining the, the, the syndrome of the householder. He says, you go to work, you become thoroughly contaminated by that association, then you come back and you try to absorb yourself in Krishna if you, if you still have some energy. Then the next morning you do your sadhana very strictly and all you, all you feel like you're doing is, is eradicating the, the, the film that has covered your consciousness from the previous days, Ugra Karma. You see? This is another reason why Srila Prabhupada was giving an increasing amount of emphasis in his later years. One scholar, in fact, gave us some more stats for those who were interested. He gave roughly 80% of his instructions on the topic of Varnashram Dharma in the last three years that he was with us. He was increasingly vocal, he increased the volume and he directed these instructions squarely at the initiated membership of ISKCON. Sureshwar and Hare Krishna Dasi, uh, my god brother and another devotee, put together a, a volume of quotes on the topic of Varnashram from Srila Prabhupada. And they entered that project with the assumption that this is something that Prabhupada intended for us to, to help other people come into Krishna consciousness, if we, as we've already explained, on the basis of Vishnu Purana and Maharaj Sagar's concern. But what they discovered as they were studying these quotes and compiling them carefully and putting them into different classifications is that most of these instructions were aimed at ISKCON. On February 14, 1977 in Mayapur, Srila Prabhupada had a very notable conversation with, I think, who was there? Maybe Hari Shori Prabhu, perhaps Satsuru Goswami and some others, I don't remember. But actually, if you listen to that conversation in Mayapur, you, you can actually, you can appreciate that his disciples are in effect arguing with Srila Prabhupada because Srila Prabhupada is pushing on this point the necessity of punya karma. Punya karma really means nothing other than dharma. And they were coming from a perspective that, you know, like Madhavendra Puri, that I, I don't have to take my morning bath anymore and please excuse me, and I'm, it's enough for me to chant Hare Krishna. And Prabhupada interrupted and said, no. Why are they falling down? Even the householders were not able to remain faithful to their spouses. What to speak of sannyasis or brahmacharis? And so many other things. I mean, even now this continues. Uh, you know, that's why the GBC funding is going largely to projects like child protection. Gone. But <clears throat> this is the idea. Uh, when, when we are sinful, it, it takes some time. And Krishna therefore says, he's, he's not saying it directly, but he's indirectly he's hinting that if, if you want to join the ranks of those who are uh, moha dvanva nirmukta, 
freed from the bewilderment that results from impious action, essentially. The, the bewilderment of duality, dualistic existence in this world. Then he says, you, you have to become engaged only in pious activity and, and you have to do it long enough to, to reach that effect. Now it's true that, that Bhakti Yoga does this, so why did Srila Prabhupada give these instructions? That's something we can perhaps argue about for a long time. But I don't want to get too far off topic here. <coughs> I've, I've already done that, in fact. It's 610. So <coughs> let me get back to this verse and what I see as one of the significant firms, uh, words in this verse. <coughs> Adbhuta. Adbhuta means what? Who remembers? Wonderful. 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 And I, I gave a few synonyms. Uh, magnificent, something extraordinary, something amazing. We find earlier in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna has also talked about Krishna consciousness with similar terms, right? Ascharjavat. People see it as amazing, they hear about it as amazing, they consider it amazing. And some people never get it at all. <laughs> That's also amazing, isn't it? Anyway, so Srila Prabhupada has given us very, very uh, sterling comments here in his purport. Just two sentences, but very, very deep. He says, on this point, the conversation was wonderful because such an important conversation between two great souls had never taken place. So there's actually four or five reasons embedded in these simple sentences. The first one, this is an important conversation. It's amazing for that reason. It's very, very important, this knowledge. Secondly, this conversation was between not just two ordinary people. One is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the other one is his pure devotee. We like to point out the mother-in-law teaches the daughter by te or teaches the daughter-in-law by teaching the daughter. <laughs> So similarly, this is what Krishna does. When he's teaching his devotees, he's actually teaching the rest of us. Arjuna doesn't need to learn these things. That's why he was placed in this so-called bewilderment on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. So the conversation is important. It's between two most important personalities. You can say Nara and Narayana, in a sense. And it had never taken place before. This Bhagavad Gita had never something like it had never happened before and would not take place again. It was wonderful that those are four reasons. And it was wonderful because the Supreme Personality of God was speaking about himself. As we say in English, from the horse's mouth. <laughs> I can say this in comparison to Krishna because Krishna incarnated as a horse once. <laughs> or at least horse head. Hayagriva. Hayagriva. Griva means neck, actually. Anyway, <clears throat> just like Dasha Griva, last night, those who were fortunate, we saw Ravana being shot and burnt. I, I should be so fortunate that all of my archers could be destroyed as quickly as his were <laughs> last night. We had this Ram Vijayotsava on the Maidan of the Gurukula campus. And, uh, I mean, he just within maybe one minute, right? He was pop and boom and gone. <laughs> so that was, that was a great inspiration. It can happen if we want it to, if we pray, if we get mercy, especially that mercy comes through the devotees. Anyway, it would not take place again. It was wonderful because the Lord was speaking about himself. So that's the most authoritative thing. If Krishna is talking about himself, you, you really cannot argue with it. And finally, Prabhupada says, <clears throat> he was discussing his energies as well. Because you cannot have Krishna without having his energy. And Krishna's supreme energy is whom? Huh? Say it louder. Loud. Jai Radhe! Because we're in Vrindavan, after all. We have to, we have to recognize. Okay. So, Madhva Charja has given us a very instructive verse about Srimati Radharani. Actually, his verse is not about Srimati Radharani. It's about Lakshmi. 
Actually, his verse is not even about Lakshmi. His verse is about the unconquerable Supreme Lord Vishnu. Ajita. Who is Ajita? Which form of Vishnu is Ajita? Yeah, they used it as a churning rod when they churned the ocean. Sagaramantana. So Ajita is the Lord who appeared there. So Madhvacharya, he says, I offer my respectful obeisances unto the unconquerable Lord, the unconquered Lord, Ajita. Why? <coughs> because Srishti Stitir Pralaya Sarga Maha Vibhutehe Vritti Prakasha Niyama Avrita Bandha Mokshaha Yasya Apanga Lava Matrata Urjita Sa Shri Yat Kartaksha Balavati Ajitam Namami. Her glance, the glance of his consort, is so powerful and so, well, for lack of a better term, wonderful, Advuta. It, it will cause your hair to stand on end because she is the one who creates everything, srishti, stiti, she maintains everything. And uh, pralaya, she destroys everything in the end. A in what form does she destroy everything? Well, her husband. Look, yeah. yeah, Lord Shiva, her, her expansion's husband, I should say. So, vritti, uh, pralaya, Sarga, she has created this material world. Mahavibhute, and all the wonders within this world. Wonder of wonders. We're talking about wonders tonight. So all the vibhutis. We can read chapter 10 of Bhagavad Gita and appreciate some of them that Krishna enumerates himself. That's most authoritative, why it's wonderful. <coughs> Srishti Stiti Pralaya Sarga Mahadevute Vritti. She has given all of us our engagements. Our, our engagement in devotional service is coming from her. Our engagement, our occupational work in the material world is also coming from her. The source of your paycheck, Prabhupada said, is not the source of your maintenance. <laughs> so that's called Vritti. And she's behind it. Lakshmi. Lakshmi is the partial expansion of Srimati Radhani. Prakasha, all of your illumination, your enlightenment is coming from Lakshmi Devi. Niyama, all of your discipline and the rules that you can follow, or the rules that you know about even to follow, is coming from her. Avrata, when you're covered over, it's also coming from her. Avrata Bandha, you're, therefore you're bound. There's nothing you can do. God has ten hands, right? Prabhupada says. What can you do with only two hands? If, if you're meant to be bound, there's not much you can do. Who is able to erase whatever fate is written on your forehead? Even the sun, who illumines all the worlds, he has to be swallowed by Rahu sometimes. Even the moon, shining amongst the firmament of stars uh, at night, the, the foremost of all the stars, has to be swallowed up by Rahu sometimes. So bandha, moksha, and your liberation is also affected by her. Yasya, apanga, lava matrata urjita. The powerful glance of this goddess of fortune, momentary and sidelong glance, not even a direct glance. Yasya, apanga, lava matrata urjita, sa. That Lakshmi, sa, it's feminine. Shri, yat kataksha balavati ajitam namami. So, urja. Now we're approaching Kartik, Kartik month. It's called Urjavrata because who is Urjeshwari? The, the, the queen of the Urja is Urja means the power and she's the queen, Srimati Radharani. In his commentary on Krishna Karnamritam, uh, the first verse of the Krishna Karnamritam of Srila Lilashuk, Bilva Mangal Thakur, <coughs> Srila Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami describes that uh, when we say Jaya Shri, what, who, who is Jaya Shri? What does Jaya Shri refer to? Srimati Radharani. Why, why is she called Jaya Shri? Because she conquers Lakshmi. Lakshmi is this powerful, as Madhvacharya rightly appreciates. She has so much power. But she's vanquished by her essence, which is Srimati Radharani. 
Lakshmi is just a partial expansion of Srimati Radharani. Durga is just a partial expansion of Lakshmi. Anybody else, uh, ladies especially, you have power. But it's coming from whom? Vrindavaneshwari, Vrajeshwari, Urjeshwari, Srimati Radharani, Jayashri. Therefore, when they say Jayashri Krishna, it actually is the same thing. Hare Krishna. <laughs> no difference. So, <clears throat> this is what he says. Therefore, we are more devotees of Srimati Radharani than we're worshipping anyone else. We're, we, we're not so much concerned about uh, Lord Narayan or even his wife or even Lord Krishna as much as we are following Srimati Radharani or trying to follow Srimati Radharani. And how do we follow Srimati Radharani? We follow the ones who are following her. We follow all the servants, all the way down, until we get to our own spiritual master. So, this is wonderful process, this is wonderful knowledge. The Lord is speaking about himself and he's speaking about his energies. And finally, I think this is the sixth wonderful thing that Prabhupada points out in his purport. <coughs> Who is he speaking to? The living entity Arjuna. And not just koi living entity, but special living entity, pure devotee. And we've already discussed that. The Lord teaches us through teaching Arjuna. Now Prabhupada brings it home, as he always does, to practically, what are we going to do about this practically? If we follow in the footsteps of Arjuna to understand Krishna, then our life will be happy and successful. <coughs> Sanjay realized this, and as he uh, began to understand it, he related the conversation to Dhritarashtra. That's described in the following verse. I won't spoil the plot tonight. But uh, Vyasa Prasadat, Shrutavan, he says, I've heard this by the mercy of Vyas. Now, Prabhupada says, it is concluded that wherever there is Krishna and Arjuna, there is victory. And there's more than that. Again, this is the final verse, literally the final verse of Bhagavad Gita. I won't go that far ahead either. Now, I had planned to speak about Adbhuta tonight, but I didn't. There is uh, just a few things that we can speak from the first canto in the third chapter. Srila Prabhupada discusses this very nicely. It's a, it's a big topic, the subject of a few more lectures. But Srila Prabhupada says the Vedas are compared to a desire tree because they contain all, no, all things knowable by man. They deal with mundane necessities as well as spiritual realization. <clears throat> The Vedas contain regulated principles of knowledge covering social, political, religious, economic, military, medicinal, chemical, physical, and metaphysical subject matter and all that may be necessary to keep the body and soul together. What do we call this in Sanskrit? Sambandhagyan. Sambandhagyan. Because the relationship is not just between the jiva and the Lord. The relationship is also between the jiva and the jiva. It's also between the jiva and the jara. That's the mundane realm. All things relate to one another. And the science of relationships, that's called sambandagyan. Without it, you cannot chant without offense. This is an important thing to consider. Every living entity, beginning from Brahma, <clears throat> desires to relish some sort of taste derived from sense perceptions. These sensual pleasures are technically called rasas. Now, it's interesting because we usually hear about rasa in terms of pure spiritual existence. And the, the general tenor of this purport by Srila Prabhupada is that we're talking about material sense gratification also. It's, there's so much that can be said about that, but it's another time. <coughs> Such rasas are of different varieties. In their revealed scriptures, the following 12 varieties of rasas are enumerated. Raudra, anger, adhuta, wonder, shringara, conjugal love, hasya, comedy, vira, chivalry, daya, mercy, dasya, servitorship, sakya, fraternity, bhayanaka, horror, bibhatsa, shock, shanta, neutrality, and vatsalya, parenthood. Now, I'm not sure exactly where Srila Prabhupada is calling this list. I haven't reviewed the commentaries on this verse. <clears throat> but different authorities have di given different lists. Bharat Muni lists nine rasas, as you know. Rupa Goswami lists twelve rasas, different from the twelve listed here. 
uh, like that. So this is an academic thing. But uh, it's interesting because adhuta, wonder, the key word in tonight's verse is, is included in this list. And that is because some, some say that actually the essence of any rasa is wonder, fascination, wonder, astonishment, amazement. This is the essence of any experience that, that, that we become attached to. When you become engrossed in a movie, Rupa Goswami says, of course, in those days they didn't have movies, they had drama, but it's the same thing. Y you forget about your life. You, you become so identified temporarily with the characters in the movie. People cry at movies. They, dis they, they come out and they're kind of disoriented because they, they've been in this alternate world for some time. It is a kind of transcendence, even within material nature but it, it transcends your ordinary, banal, mundane existence. That is called rasasvadhanam. And the essence of that rasasvadhanam, or rasa experience, is arbhuta, wonder. So th this is why it's so significant, in my opinion, for what it's worth, that, that this word is used here. This mayakaram, as Baladevi Dabhushan said, it, is, it, it causes one to wonder, this 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 conversation of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, we don't know if we have time, but I, I think we do have time. I'm just going to read very quickly the uh, Gita Mahatnam that is given by Srila Prabhupada at the end of his uh, introduction because it, it tells us some of the glories and some of the wonderful qualities of the Bhagavad Gita. <coughs> if one reads Bhagavad Gita very sincerely with all seriousness, then by the grace of the Lord the reactions of his past misdeeds will not act upon him. One may cleanse himself daily by taking a bath in water, but if one takes a bath even once in the sacred Ganges water of Bhagavad Gita, for him the dirt of material life is altogether vanquished. Because Bhagavad Gita is spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one need not read any other Vedic literature. One need only attentively and regularly hear and read Bhagavad Gita. One who drinks the water of the Ganges attains salvation. So what to speak of one who drinks the nectar of Bhagavad Gita? Bhagavad Gita is the essential nectar of the Mahabharata and it is spoken by Lord Krishna himself, the original Vishnu. Gita Upanishad, Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all the Upanishads and it's just like a cow. Lord Krishna, who's famous as cowherd boy, Gopala, is milking this cow. Arjuna is just like a calf, and learned scholars and pure devotees are to drink the nectarian milk of Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> Let there be one scripture only, one common scripture for the whole world, Bhagavad Gita. Let there be one deity for the whole world, Sri Krishna. One mantra, one prayer, the chanting of his holy name, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And let there be one work only, the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. There's more that we can say about this. Um, so many references are there to glorify the Bhagavad Gita and why it's such a wonderful book. But these are the, therefore, by the time we get to the end of this Bhagavad Gita, uh, Sanjaya says, his hair is standing on end. I remember the first time I read the Bhagavad Gita, I, I could not put the book down. And I was reading it continuously. And when I, when I came to the end and saw that Sanjaya was saying this, I was thinking, wow, I, I'm actually experiencing something a little bit like that also. It was so enlivening to hear this transcendental knowledge. Because there's nothing so, so, pure, and and, and, and sublime, so pure and sublime in this world as transcendental knowledge. And uh, ultimately that culminates in pure devotional service, which is just full of wonders. Devotional service is full of endless wonder. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> these are a few things we can say about this verse. Now I'll stop. If anybody has any questions or comments, we can try to say something further. Uh, Maharaj, you want to add something, please? Or Do we have a microphone extra? <coughs> There's a few of them. 
this one, I think it's from Padma Purana. I don't remember offhand. Maybe somebody else knows. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I got some idea that Sankaracharya did he write something like that? Uh, Shankaracharya wrote a different thing. I, I think it's entitled Gita Dhyana, but you have to understand that many of the things that are ascribed to Shankaracharya he may not have even wrote. I mean, it, it's almost like if somebody can't figure out who wrote something, then they, they just say Shankaracharya wrote it, <laughs> and there's no way to prove or disprove it anyway. So, yeah, but he, 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 is, uh, he is credited with one Gita Dhyanam, I think, in, in maybe less verses. There's, like I said, there's several of them. So many have appreciated Bhagavad Gita for so many thousands of years. Isn't this a wonderful thing? I mean, we have our conversations every day, but who's worshiping them 5,000 years later? <laughs> worshiping them. We keep Bhagavad Gita on our altar, isn't it? At home. This is the nature of this wonderful conversation. Glorious Gita. In fact, Narad Pancharatra, if I'm not mistaken, it says, a very interesting verse, in Kali Yuga, the chanting of the holy name is the process, Bala Gopal is the deity, Ganga ri is the river, and Bhagavad Gita is the Shastra. <laughs> if, if I remember correctly, that's, that's my paraphrasing. Don't recall the shloka offhand. So Bhagavad Gita is so important. Is that okay? Thank you. Sorry, I didn't know. Yes, uh, Bojade Prabhu. How are you doing for the wonderful, wonderful class? This is probably a whole, uh, another whole lecture, but I thought it was a very interesting comment that without understanding some Manyayana, one cannot chant offensively. Without understanding one's relationship to Krishna and, like you said, matter spirit and everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, can you elaborate on that a bit? Well, Bhakti Vinod Thakur mentions this in his, I think it's in his Hari Namish and Tamani. Somewhere, if, if not there, it's, he, he does mention like this. It's, like you said, it's, it's a big topic, but uh, y you really can't have the Lord without his energies. This is the essence of it. And that's one of the wonderful things that Prabhupada has said in his purport today, that this knowledge is coming not only from Krishna, but Krishna, I mean, Krishna is not only explaining himself, but he's also explaining his energies. Srila Prabhupada used to say that, some, you know, many religions, they say God is great, right? But they don't know how great he is. And that's because of there's a lack in Sambandha Gyan. And as long as we remain uh, a bodhajata, in ignorance of this Sambandha Gyan, it's not very likely that we'll be able to make as, uh, as rapid advancement as we could. So that's a very important point, and it's, I think, one of many reasons that Prabhupada was, was pushing on this, this principle that I mentioned regarding chapter 7, text 28. Is that okay? A brief comment. A anything else? Thank you. Should you want to add something, Prabhu? Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> what is it? the meaning of Dwanda Moha Nirmukta? Yeah, his question is what is the meaning of Dwanva Moha Nirmukta? I tried to explain. Dwanva Moha means the bewilderment of duality. That bewilderment is the result of karma, of karma that is not Dharma. Uh, you know, I guess you can say it's vikarma. And we should remember there's no such thing as vikarma yoga. <laughs> That's, that follows directly from 728 as well. So, you know, if we're engaged in action, but it's not, it's not ordained action or, or, or sanctioned, then that, that just entangles us further, not only in the reactions of the action, but in the the film or the stain on our psychology that, 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 that embeds us uh, or, or galvanizes our attachments to this material world, the duality of the material world. Dwanva, moha. Moha means bewilderment, dwanva means duality. It's a very complicated banyan tree and we cannot get out of it, um, you know, in, unless we come to this state somehow or other, by mercy, by whatever means necessary. And I, I think that Prabhupada saw that when he had established something in, in the form of Iskan, he, he was trying to boil the milk, as he said. And this is one of the aspects, this emphasis on becoming dharmic, dharmatma. It's very, very important. Mukta Sangha means the same thing? Mukta Sangha can be, see, can be seen in the same way, yeah. 
And it's very interesting because Rupa Goswami in Padyavali, he comments there that uh, the Holy Name has two aspects, or the Supreme Personality of Godhead, for that matter, has two aspects. He's Taraka, who takes you out of the infection. He cleans you up, washes you off, and then sends you home. And once you get home, then there's Paraka takes over, who is, who is giving you the, the, you know, reintroducing you, so to speak, to your real life. Those two things are affected through the chanting of the Holy Name. And that's why we say Mukta Sangha Param Prajet. They, they indicate those two things, as I see it at least. So, yeah, and, and uh, you know, the chanting of the Holy Name is it's very important that it has to be offenseless. Is that okay? Okay, is there nothing else then? Oh, the one in the back? Far in the back. I uh, think so. It is six sons of sisters to go. Chetanana Mahaprabhu is praying that one way. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand your question. Can you hear me? No. Radhe Radhe. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. I, I'm not sure I follow your question. You're, you're, you're relating this, today's verse, with the sixth verse of the Shikshashtakam, in which Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that I, you know, I did. He's saying that when the hair of my body is done a name, yeah. yeah. So here, Sanjaya is in ecstasy simply by hearing the conversation between Krishna and Jew. He said mm-hmm. he's done a name. So I'm asking what is the lesson we learn from this to uh, compare it? Well, one thing is that in the Brihad Bhagavat Amritam, Sanatana Goswami has very explicitly written in, in a very, I mean, in a, in a very crucial spot as well, that actually the definition of prema is absolute and unconditional humility. There's no distinction between those two things. If one has absolute and unconditional humility, one also has prema, because that is prema. <laughs> it, it's kind of like surubena vyavasthiti, when, when one is reinstated in one's natural condition. This is the quality of the soul, this humility. Srimati Radharani, of course, she manifests this humility more than anyone else can. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has spoken the final verses of the Shikshastikam in her voice. And he's expressing his own humility in the same way. That's, I mean, the, the, the principle is so crucial that he put it in the third verse as our formula that Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami says we should tie around our neck. That we should feel ourselves more humble than a blade of grass, more tolerant than a tree, ready to offer respects without expecting any honor. If we can do those things, then we can chant the holy name. And by chanting the holy name in that mood, then we become so much advanced. But I would, I would only, I mean, I can only volunteer that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was feeling that gen- genuinely and also thereby setting that example for the rest of us because he's Bhaktavatar. He's, he's, he's like the teacher writing on the chalkboard. He's not learning his ABCs. He doesn't have a problem with uh, his attachment to the holy name, but he's, he's trying to show us what we can attain if we choose to by cultivating that kind of humility. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Anything else? <clears throat> then I thank you very much. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. Thank you very much.